the Classical Liberal Seminar. My name is Ivan Marinovich, and I am on the Stanford faculty. Before we start today, a few housekeeping, housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, we are recording, and we typically post the recordings, just so you know. So we've changed our policy, and we are recording these talks and posting them on YouTube. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say, so this morning, a trans friend of mine asked me uh, whether this seminar would be an anti-trans seminar. And let me just quickly answer that. We have friends and family members who are trans. We love them and respect them. So we are not anti-anything. We have a bias, but, but it's not an anti-anything bias. We have an anti-orthodoxy bias and a pro-right to disagree bias. That's all. So having said that, let me introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Alex Byrne. He's a philosopher at, the, at, at MIT. He's known for his works in the fields of philosophy of mind and philosophy of perception. He has made significant contributions to topics such as color perception, the nature of consciousness, and the philosophy of vision. And he's here to talk about his most recent and controversial book, Trouble with Genders. Welcome, Alex. Ivan, thanks very much indeed. Um... It's a, a great honor to be included in this series. So as, as you said, I recently finished a book, Trouble with Gender, Sex Facts, Gender Fictions, which was released in the UK a couple of weeks ago. It will be out in the US at the beginning of January. Um, meantime, if you want to get someone a late Christmas present, you can pre-order it on Amazon. So before getting to my main topic, which is gender identity, uh, I, I think it will be helpful to give a bit of background, set the stage, especially given your um, uh, your um, participants' qu uh, query about whether this would be some some an anti-trans session. So as as you all know, uh, which I, I certainly hope it won't be, but as you all know, the uh, the gender wars are well named. They're raging on both sides of the Atlantic with no armistice in sight. Uh, however, my own discipline of philosophy, known for its tolerance, going back to Socrates, indeed admiration of gadflies and heretics, has got to be a civilized a backwater of rational disagreement, right? Um, well, of course, I'm uh, I'm joking. Unfortunately, it's far from that. Some of you will have heard of Kathleen Stock, um, a philosopher who in 2018 raised a few mild objections to the then proposed reform of the UK's 2004 Gender Recognition Act, which would have ushered in a form of gender self-identification. As a result, uh, f fire and brimstone rained down on her for three years, after which she resigned from Sussex University in the UK, where she'd taught for many years in 2021. She did manage to write an excellent book, uh, Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism in the Interim, as well as pick up an OBE, or Order of the British Empire, in the 2021 New Year's Honours List. That award prompted an open letter from many of her colleagues in philosophy denouncing Stock, who happens to be a liberal lesbian, for furthering gender oppression and reinforcing the patriarchy. That is what the letter literally said. As they say, you, uh, you simply can't make this stuff, up, this stuff up. Eventually, that letter was signed by, I think, um, almost 800 people. The gender wars are not only raging across the Atlantic, but also up in the frozen north. Amy Hamm is a nurse in British Columbia who has been under investigation by the British Columbia College of Nurses and Midwives for making comments like women don't have penises and um, gender identity is metaphysical nonsense in her spare time. It It isn't in dispute that her gender critical views um, affected her professional work as a nurse. She's always kept her, as I understand it, professional work and uh, uh, private um, off-hours advocacy very separate. The investigation into her just hit the three-year mark, believe it or not, and uh, last week Kathleen Stock testified as an expert witness 
on Ham's behalf. And in, entirely unsurprisingly, if you follow these dramas, the lawyer for the College of Nurses declined to ask Stock a single question. With the departure of Stock, the number of prominent gender-critical feminist philosophers with positions in academia is hovering around one, Holly Lawford-Smith, who's at Melbourne University in Australia, and who seems to be in a perpetual state of, um, of uh, cancellation. So be because of the in increasing censoriousness in philosophy and elsewhere. In 2021, the philosopher Peter Singer started the Journal of Controversial Ideas with two colleagues. And here's Lawford Smith on the left in the latest issue. Uh, this is a, a tweet or a post, perhaps we should say these days by Peter Singer. Um, she had a paper writing about women only spaces with uh, Kate Phelan. So that this paper appeared in the Journal of Controversial Ideas instead of a mainstream journal of feminist philosophy should tell you a lot about the, the current climate. Lawford Smith has a new book, Sex Matters, which you can see here on the right. Uh, my own book and hers were under contract with Oxford University Press and both were cancelled at around the same time by Oxford. So my, my book found a new publisher, Polity, but Lawford Smith enlisted the help of the UK's Free Speech Union, and they forced Oxford to backtrack and publish the book. It's quite an astounding state of affairs when some, uh, the, presumably the threat of legal action forced the second oldest university press in the world to publish a book that they didn't want to publish. So this is from the latest issue of the Journal of Controversial Ideas, a paper defending the permissibility of sex with animals, published under a pseudonym, Fira Benstow. Now that is more like it. This is um, what you would expect to see in that journal, not some paper about women-only spaces discussing a topic that regularly appears in UK newspapers. Now, I have published in the Journal of Controversial Ideas myself. And in fact, I believe I'm the most published author in the Journal of Controversial Ideas. So what are my controversial ideas, presumably far away from the, uh, um, the edges of the Overton window? So here are the three things that I've had in the JCI. Did I perhaps argue that heterosexuality should be enforced down the barrel of a gun or that animals are placed on earth for our sexual pleasure. I mean, not even the pseudonymous author of the zoophilia paper went that far. Well, nothing, nothing at all like that. The first two pieces on the slide replies to objections to my radical claim that women are simply the mature or adult females of our species, that women are adult human females, in other words, Believe it or not, that's extremely controversial in in philosophy. Uh, the third piece is a long survey article about pronouns, which was commissioned by Oxford University Press and then summarily cancelled shortly before they cancelled Trouble with Gender. I really would have been in a tough spot without the Journal of Controversial Ideas. So every chance I get, I thank uh, Peter Singer and his two collaborators, Jeff McMahon and um, Francesca Minerva. And I, I wrote about my adventures down the, the rabbit hole of sex and gender for Quillette in April of this year. If you're interested, you can easily find this piece at Quillette or on my homepage. Okay, so uh, let me get to the, uh, the main topic, gender identity. So a Amy Ham, the British Columbia nurse, called gender identity metaph metaphysical nonsense. And metaphysical is, of course, a paradigmatic philosophical word. So it sounds like gender identity is an appropriate topic of philosophical inquiry. And indeed, I have in the book a chapter on gender identity. So let's talk about that. 
Gender identity is ev now everywhere, of course, in popular culture, uh, the law, education, and healthcare. Uh, on, on the left is a snippet from Wikipedia about the Equality Act, which is now stalled in the Senate. The Act proposes to replace sex in the 1964 Civil Rights Act with sex, including sexual orientation and gender identity. And on the right is the Gender Identity Workbook for Kids, uh, published in 2018, I think, one of many such books. So where did gender identity begin? Well, it was first clearly defined in 1964 by two psychiatrists at UCLA, Robert Stoller and Ralph Greenson. Here are their two papers, uh, Stoller's A Contribution to the Study of Gender Identity and Greenson's on homosexuality and gender identity. Greenson is on the right. Uh, he was Marilyn Monroe's psychiatrist, uh, which somehow, if you look at him, doesn't seem that surprising. Both Stoller and Greenson's definitions of gender identity are essentially uh, equivalent, but let's look at uh, uh, Greenson's, which is down here. Gender identity... Greenson says, refers to one's sense of being a member of a particular sex. That is one's sense that one is a member of the female sex or one sense that one is a member of the male sense, the, the male sex. And Stoller wrote a, an influential book, Sex and Gender, which um, actually later in the, in the 70s had a, a, a big uh, influence on... Um, second wave feminist writing. He wrote that book in, in 1968. And uh, there, what was formerly simply gender identity became what Stoller called core gender, core gender identity. This is how he explained it. Almost everyone starts to develop from birth on a fundamental sense of belonging to one sex. The child's awareness, I am a male or I am a female, is visible to an observer in the first year or so of life. This aspect of one's overall sense of identity can be conceptualized as a core gender identity. And a couple of years before that, in 1966, the psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg defined gender identity in basically the same way as Stoller and Greenson. Presumably he was influenced by both of them. Uh, gender identity, he said, is the cognitive self-categorization as boy or girl. He's Here he's specifically just talking about, about children. And this illustrates how simply labeling a phenomenon can be theoretically uh, productive. Suddenly you realize that, yeah, wow, something needs to be explained. Right, children realize at some point they're girls or boys. That's pretty obvious. But when does that happen? And what cues do they use to come to that realization? And so in, in, ensued some productive work in child development. Um, other psychologists introduced related notions, for instance, gender stability, um, the realization that growing up doesn't change your sex, that um, if you're a boy now, then you'll grow up to be a man. And if you're a girl now, then you grow up to be a woman. And what's sometimes called gender consistency, that you can't change sex by adopting the behavior or clothing of the other sex. You can't turn a boy into a girl um, by making him wear dresses or having him play with dolls. And it, it, it takes children a while. I mean, after they've developed gen gender identity, they can categorize themselves as a boy or a girl. It takes children a while to reach both gender stability and gender uh, consistency. So that's all great. That's all great. There's nothing puzzling about this or problematic about this kind of, of gender identity. And it's certainly not metaphysical nonsense. Okay, but then later in the 21st century, and a little bit before, uh, things began to change. So WPATH is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and they publish periodically their standards of care, kind of medical manual for the care and treatment of transgender people. 
and um, the Standards of Care 7 was published in uh, 2011. Stand We're now up to eight that was published last year in 2022. Previous Standards of Care didn't um, have a glossary where terms were defined. Um, the phrase gender identity does occur in the earlier Standards of Care but it's doing no serious theoretical work. It's, it occurs mostly in the phrase gender identity disorder, um, which I'll, I'll come to later. It's now called gender dysphoria. Anyway, in um, standards of care seven and standards of care eight, gender identity is uh, defined. And this is the way it's defined in standards of care eight, very similar to standards of care seven. Gender identity refers to a person's deeply felt, we can pass that over, internal, intrinsic sense of their own gender. So that adds internal and intrinsic to the Stoller and Greenson definition, and one might wonder exactly what that means and why those words are there. If that was all that was going on, if gender in this quotation meant sex, then we'd have a pretty close approximation to the original Stoller and Greenson definition. Unfortunately, however, it is perfectly clear that gender here does not mean sex. Exactly what gender means is extremely obscure. The only thing is that, that is clear is that it, uh, it does not mean sex. So now we have an immediate striking departure from the original conception of gender identity as formulated by Stoller and Greenson. So that's bad. So we have a new kind of gender identity. There's a um, there's one component of that new kind of gender identity that I, I, I won't make much of in the rest of the talk, but I should briefly remark on. Um, so having a conviction that my gender, whatever that is, is such and such, that's one thing. Being right, namely my gender really is such and such, that's quite another. The, the point's even more uh, obvious with Stoller and Greenson's definition. Some children are in error about their sex. A, a boy might mistakenly think he's a member of the female sex, for example. And of course, when children are born, they have a sex, but they don't have any views, right or wrong, about what sex they are. So you are not the absolute best person to know and declare your sex, although as it happens, since sex is such a um, an obvious feature of, of people, you're uh, an extremely reliable guide to what your sex is. But sometimes, you know, other people are in a are in a better position. In very rare cases, however. Um, the, the new kind of gender identity departs from the old kind in just that respect. Whatever your gender is, you are the world's best authority on it. So this is from the Gender Identity Workbook for Kids. Who is the best, the, the, who is the absolute best person to know and declare your gender? You, there are so many genders and the expert on your gender is you. There are a lot of exclamation marks in this book. I I just mentioned this in yeah, uh, in passing. Uh, as I say, I'm not going to make uh, anything of it. So here's an authoritative 2020 textbook on pediatric gender identity edited by some of the leaders in the field. They give the standard account of being transgender in terms of gender identity. So transgender is an umbrella term describing individuals whose gender identity does not align in a traditional sense with the gender they were assigned at birth. And not only um, are transgender people those who have a, a misaligned or not conventionally aligned gender identity, gender identity is actually universal. Each of us they say, uh, has a gender identity, though many of us, many of us never give it much thought and no citations or evidence are provided for this claim. So if you put universality 
together with the idea that transgender people have gender identities that are not aligned with their sexed bodies, you get this familiar picture where humanity is cleaved into two partitions, one very much smaller than the other. So here we have the people whose gender identities don't align with their sexed bodies. Those are the cisgender people. And then the rest of humanity are cisgender. Their gender identities match their sexed bodies. There's another feature of the new kind of gender identity. So a very important one. Gender dysphoria is... Um, persisting discomfort or distress at one's sexed body and at the social expectations that are associated with having a body of that of that kind some people suffer from gender dysphoria now this other feature of the new kind of gender identity links gender identity identity to a causal explanation of gender dysphoria some people have gender dysphoria one might wonder well why why is it that some people have this sense that something is off, uh, if they could somehow change their sex body uh, to the other sex, then they would. Why do some people feel that way? Um, according to um, contemporary orthodoxy, that that is because they have misaligned gender identities. So here's uh, W. Path again from the standards of Care 7, Gender dysphoria is distress that is caused by a discrepancy between a person's gender identity and that person's sex assigned at birth and the associated gender role and or primary and secondary sex characteristics. So we, in effect, have a little theory here. Gender identity, whatever it is, has a polarity. The the gender identity needle can point to male at one extreme or female at the other extreme, and perhaps also at positions in, in between. Transgender people, and here we can just point to some well-known examples like Caitlyn Jenner or Jazz Jennings or Elliot Page, they have gender identities that don't match their sex bodies. Uh, Gender identity is universal. Everyone has one. That's number two. Often it's also said to be innate and immutable. So we can we can add that in. And finally, number three, gender dysphoria is caused by a mismatch between one's gender identity and one's sex body. So this is a little theory. And the, uh, the central theoretical term is gender identity. So here we have someone with a normal um, female body, but a male gender identity. So that on the one hand gives you a transgender person. And on the other hand, that mismatch uh, means there's a, a risk, perhaps a considerable risk of gender dysphoria. So if we want to resolve the gender dysphoria, the solution is to change either the person's gender identity to nudge the needle over to the right into the bred female zone or else to change the body to turn it as much as possible into a facsimile of a, of a male body. And given that gender identity is, is immutable, whereas the body is at least to some extent mutable, uh, there's only one solution, namely change uh, on this view, namely change the body. Okay, so that's the, that's the theoretical role of the new kind of gender identity. But what one question we should get out of the way, first of all, is could the old Stoller Greenson kind, which is like perfectly intelligible, kosher, it's in good order, could that serve the purpose uh, just as well? Uh, that is, um, could we understand gender identity as one sense of being a member of a particular sex? That was uh, Greenson's explanation. Um, and with gender identity understood in that way, is it true 
that transgender people have mismatched gender identities, that gender identity is universal, and that gender dysphoria is caused by a, a mismatch. Well, on number two, um, gender identity in the, the old sense, the Stoller Greenson sense, uh, is universal or, or pretty much universal. Almost everyone uh, it has a conviction that they're either male or a conviction that they're uh, female. It's also um, immutable in the sense that it's just very difficult to get someone to, if some someone's already convinced that he's male, it's extremely difficult to get him to change his mind. It, it's not um, innate, at least in the sense of, uh, of not being learned. The Stoller greenson kind of gender identity is very plausibly learned, so at least on that conception of innateness as not learned, it isn't innate, so maybe we should put a question mark there. So, uh, uh, okay, so, so far so good. Um, uh, the old kind of gender identity satisfies near enough two, but unfortunately it doesn't satisfy either one or three. So it's easy to find transgender people who are under no illusion as to their sex. A transgender man, for instance, might know that he's female. So there is no mismatch um in uh, uh there's no mismatch in his case between the old kind of gender identity and his sexed body and neither is uh, gender dysphoria caused by a mismatch or in general caused by a mismatch between the old kind of gender identity and one's sexed body indeed knowing what your sex is can just make gender dysphoria uh, worse So we really do have something new. The old kind won't do if this is the theory. So let's try to let's try to test this theory. Um, is there something which we could call gender identity which satisfies one, two, and three? So here's one test which might naturally occur to you. What if we raised an ordinary boy as a girl? So we take an ordinary baby boy, we castrate him and raise him as a girl, and we make surgical and medical interventions as appropriate. So he would have, or he'd be very, very likely to have a male gender identity, but he'd be treated socially as a girl and have, if not literally a female body, at least a decent facsimile of one. There would then be a mismatch and we would expect to the child to suffer gender dysphoria. So that's a, that, that is a, seems to be a, a prediction of this new theory. Um, well, maybe it's like pointless raising this because isn't this just a macabre piece of science fiction? Well, as I'm sure some of you know, uh, it isn't. Um, uh, I'm sure some of you who um, are aware of this 2000 book by John Colapinto, As Nature Made Him, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Girl, which describes the tragic case of David Reimer, whose penis was burnt off in a botched circumcision. Uh, the child was reassigned female and raised as a girl to cut a long and uh, terrible story short. It didn't work out. And when he was in his teens, David reverted to living as male. He later married a woman and committed suicide when he was 28. Now, sometimes this is taken as the crucial experiment showing that gender identity is innate, immutable, and when mismatched with one's sex body, responsible for gender dysphoria. So here's the director of transgender medicine at a New York hospital commenting on the case described by Colapinto. We cannot change people's gender identity despite the most intense program for doing so. It's like the Truman Show. There he's referring to that movie with Jim Carrey. We're raising someone from infancy to believe something, having their parents part of the plan, and surgically altering their body, and it still fails. However, this um, poor outcome is actually somewhat anomalous. Admittedly, the sample sizes are very small. 
but this is a 1989 paper describing four boys who were raised as girls following traumatic loss of the penis shortly after birth, two months after birth in one case. The two, the two who were adults living as women at the time the paper was written were doing well. The other two, one was a senior in high school, were also apparently fine. There are many other kinds of cases that are relevant, which I don't have time to get into, but they all point, I think, in the same general direction. Namely, it really is possible to raise boys as girls or girls as boys setting ethical and surgical complications aside. Now, it's Im important to distinguish two very different ideas. One we could call gender blank slatism, that, that there are no innate psychobehavioral sex differences. And the other we can call cross-gender rearing, that you can raise boys as girls, um, and vice versa, and that if you're again setting ethical issues uh, aside, um, if the like the parents are on board with the deception, then there's every reason to think that this will be uh, uh, a success, or at least it's very likely to be a success. These are really quite different. Now there is a connection between them, namely, if you're a gender blank slatist then it's natural also to hold this cross-gender rearing thesis that boys can be raised as girls and vice versa. After all, if very young boys and girls differ only anatomically, then what's to prevent us successfully rearing a boy as a girl? But the, the converse doesn't hold. There's no tension. I will go on to suggest why in a, um, in a, in a little bit. There's no tension in holding cross-gender rearing you can raise boys as girls and vice versa, but rejecting gender blank slatism. So let me just say something about why uh, gender blank slatism should be rejected. Um, so the quote on the left is from Melissa Hines, who's a uh, psychologist at Cambridge University in the UK. It's one of the best researchers in this area. This is from a paper of hers in 2015. There is reliable evidence that prenatal androgen concentrations influence children's gender type toy preferences, as well as other gendered aspects of children's play. For example, boys are much more likely to go in for what's called rough and tumble play than, uh, than girls. And there's also convergent evidence from other primates. So on the right is a report about a paper by a uh, Sonia Kallenberg and Richard Wrangham, which appeared in Current Biology in 2010, I think. Uh, so y young chimps tend to carry sticks in a way that's very reminiscent of a kind of doll play. And as in human children, this behavior is more common in, in females than males. So there's every reason to reject gender blank slatism. Um, the the mechanism whereby boys and girls come out of the womb um, with different psychological and behavioral behavioral tendencies on on average is no huge uh, mystery. So uh, now back to to cross gender rearing. Um, because of the falsity of gender blank slatism, boys raised as girls will be more masculine than typical girls as well. We can throw in uh, as well as likely having a gynophilic sexual orientation. That is a sexual orientation um, towards, towards women rather than men. But you can see that this is not... Uh, incompatible at all with living comfortably as uh, as a girl. After all, there are tomboys, that is, females, female children, who are much more masculine in their behavior and um, preferences than uh, than typical girls. They they're also much more likely to be uh, to be lesbians, and your typical tomboy 
will turn out um uh to be a you know a perfectly happy girl perfectly happy woman well, of course sometimes there are some some bumps in the road uh the road along the way so masculinity and gynophilia are quite compatible with living comfortably uh as a girl so that's no um clearly no barrier to the success of of cross gender rearing okay so that's one argument against uh the new conception of uh, gender identity here's another one so this is a, a 2021 paper that reported on the the long term outcome of um, I think 139 boys who were seen at a Toronto clinic for gender identity disorder, uh, as it used to be called, now called, as I mentioned earlier, uh, gender dysphoria. Gender identity disorder was the old diagnosis in the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, Man uh, of uh, Mental Disorders. So the boys either met the DSM criteria for gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder or came very close and followed up into uh, into adulthood, uh, close to 90% had resolved dysphoria by the time they grew up. So in, in, in clinical terminology, 12% were persisters and 88% were desisters. So the boys who 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 desisted, whose gender identity identity disorder was resolved in adulthood, did not, on the sort of orthodox story, have a mismatched gender identity. They they, they were cisgender boys all along. Now, parsimony suggests that the dysphoria in the persisters had the same basic causes as those in the. Uh, in the desisters. And if that's right, then the mismatch explanation is redundant because whatever explains the gender dysphoria in the boys who desisted, it's not that their gender identities were mismatched with their sexed bodies. And this is like this basic picture is perfectly familiar. So two brothers, for example, might become depressed for the very same reason. You know, their dad died, say. But the depression might persist in one brother and not in the other for all sorts of reasons, like personality differences or difference in social circumstances, or noise in the system, whatever. Same cause, even though the long-term outcome is different. Okay, so you can think of this uh, little theory as setting out a, um, a job description for something that we could call gender identity. It mismatches the sexed body in transgender people. It's universal, innate, immutable. And um, when mismatched with the sexed body, it causes gender dysphoria. And the, the moral of our discussion, or the moral I wish to draw, is that nothing answers to this job description. Uh, in other words, as popularly conceived, gender identity is a myth. Although, just to repeat a point from, uh, from, from the very start, gender identity as originally conceived by Stoller and Greenson is very, it's very far from a myth. It's actually a very useful notion. So last slide, the, the new orthodox kind of gender identity is a myth. It's, in that respect, it's like the Loch Ness Monster. But um, unlike the myth of the prehistoric plesiosaur surviving in a cold Scottish lake, it's not a harmless and amusing diversion. It has real consequences. But um, like the myth of Nessie, the myth of gender identity will be with us for many years to come. That is the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, great talk. So let's open it up for questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand and I'll moderate. Let me see. Maybe I can ask you a question uh, to start. Uh, so this is a question about this uh, 
you know, this debate. I see a huge asymmetry uh, in terms of the debate regarding what is a woman, for example, versus what is a man, right? So it seems at least in the sort of, um, in, in, the, in our culture, there is more debate, more disagreement about, you know, what is a woman, right? You see a, a big uh, disagreement over that. And I wonder what explains the asymmetry. Do you have any any ideas, any explanations for why we have that? Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I, I should say that the, that, that on the one hand, there's, there's the what is a woman debate, um, yeah, which is just another kind of example of how how surreal these these issues have have become. Um, I mean that that question was asked in Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex in 1949, and now it's the title of a documentary by by Matt Walsh. It's really extremely bizarre. Um, so the the first point I'd like to make is that um, not that you were saying anything to the contrary, but uh, the orthodox conception of gender identity should be sharply prized away from issues about what about who is and who isn't a woman. Uh, these these are entirely separate issues. You can you could accept the orthodox conception of, of of gender identity and have any view you like about uh about the nature of uh the nature of of women um i think the only reason for the for the asymmetry is that the issue of women only spaces is just much more pressing and, and urgent and regarded by many people as very important than the issue of, of, of male only spaces. That's the only reason. I mean, I do think that um, was it, the, the asymmetry is only in the amount of attention given to what is a woman as opposed to, as opposed to what is a man. It's, it, it's not as if uh, there's any inconsistency. Some people, let's say, define men as adult uh, male human beings, but define um, women as something else. I, there's generally a lot of consistency there. Of course, you would want both men and women to be basically defined in in the same way. It's just that men, I mean, not that I wish to speak for my half of humanity, but um, men in general don't really care very much about um, who gets into um, who gets into male uh, prisons. They don't care very much about who gets into nominally male-only sporting events. And the reason why they don't, uh, let's just take this, the um, the sporting case. The reason why men don't care whether say trans men are allowed into the male sporting categories that they they don't have an advantage even if they take lots of lots of testosterone so thank you that makes sense john and then jonathan thank you for the talk um so i think um one question you you, you it showed that um, most people do develop, a, you know, the, I don't know the words, the proper words to use, but they decide they're girls or boys uh, the way we would. Uh, and then, but with, there's no denying that there are a few people uh, num and surveys put them, I don't know, 5%-ish who, who don't come, who, who grow up and feel like uh, they, their feeling of gender is different from uh, their bodies. Now, uh, some of the you didn't really get at the central debate, um, which is um, I think we all uh, appreciate we want trans people to have rights in the sense of be able to uh, be fully functioning and accepted members of society. But some of the political um, uh, movement says that we have to deny uh, gendered biology of mammals in order to do that that we may not teach in medical schools that there is such a thing 
as a, a, you know the XX versus XY chromosome has effects on the human body, uh, and that that may not be you know investigated in science. That seems like a, a that seems like the central proposition, uh, and a, in my view, a very dangerous one for trans rights because if we have to say that the moon is made of green cheese to defend the rights of trans people, then that's going to really hurt the rights of trans people. To your, you know, I think some of the issue, which you didn't really clarify, is going from there are undoubtedly some people who feel a difference between their uh, their gender and their sex body, I think is the word you use, to a view that that's all of us and that uh, uh, we deny that the most people uh, don't, in fact, lie on a spectrum like that. And my second question that you didn't quite get to is the question of government censorship. Uh, so you reported the UK, Canada, and Australia uh, seem to have not just a um, censorious philosophy department, but actually you can be uh, arrested and thrown in jail for saying uh, unpopular things about that. And I wonder if you have, have comments on the censorship aspect of these ideas. Oh, right. Yeah, excellent question. Um, yeah, on the, on the first... And um, the question of 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 prevalence. I mean, you mentioned five percent, which I think on any on any account is 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 a bit too high. Um, I mean, estimates that vary a great deal, and of course, it all depends what 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 question is being asked. And now you. Um, you do not have to have uh, ever gender dysphoria in order to count as in order to count as as tra trans transgender. So o over the years, the category of um, transgender has become larger and larger, and it's not um, just comprised of people with extreme discomfort at their at their sex body. So in other words, just asking the question um, of some sample, do you identify as as, as transgender or not, is not it, uh, going to get you the number of people who actually have some serious medical psychological condition that requires some kind of some kind of intervention. I mean just to give you an idea of how how things have have changed if i'm recalling correctly in the the dsm5 the um the prevalence figures for gender identity disorder in males was something like 1 in 30,000 and for um um for women it was for females it was more like 1 in 1 in 100,000 it was extremely rare extremely rare um rare condition uh it's become a lot less a lot less rare since for no doubt very very um complicated reasons but anyway your so you your um one one of your question sorry one one of the strands of your first question was about um denying facts about sex biology um and to um obviously we shouldn't have to do that in order to promote uh, the rights of transgender people, and of course that's absolutely right. And uh, as you as you as you pointed out, it, it's just a complete disaster for uh, for trans rights if they are hung on um, an extremely wonky peg of um, biology denial. Uh, of course, you don't want. Yeah, I mean, it's just. I mean, a good analogy is the 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 um, in the end, extremely successful campaign for gay rights. That campaign did not hinge on any uh, completely ridiculous claims about what it is to be to be gay or 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 same sex attracted. Um, and of course, that was all. That was all. That was all. To the to the good. There's no need to make stuff up in order uh, to secure to secure gay rights. And in the case of trans trans rights, that that that's also uh, that's also true. Um, 
I mean, it's more, the issue is definitely more complicated, however, in the in the trans rights case because in 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 that case you are talking about medical sometimes very serious medical medical in, interventions whereas in the whereas in the gay rights case there's no question and in right these days there's no question of any treatment no one no gay person needs to be treated um whereas um of course many Trans people think, yeah, well, I need certain quite invasive kinds of of medical care in order to help me help me function in in uh, in in society. Okay, and then on the I, I don't don't know if that completely addresses your first question, but the second question was about about censoriousness. Um, of course, we w- one. I mean, I'm a transplant from the UK, and uh, one thing that I do very much appreciate about the US is the is the First Amendment. There's no equivalent of the First Amendment in in the UK, and uh, lots of gender critical women in the UK were fond of going around saying things like "women do not have penises" or something. Um, of um have had very serious serious repercussions because of because of what they've said um and i mentioned the case of of amy ham in in canada so that is all uh extremely i mean as a free speech uh, enthusiast myself that is all extremely unfortunate we are somewhat better off in the in the us though I don't know if that completely. I, I'm sure that didn't completely answer your your complicated questions. No, no. Um, okay. Uh, let me say that um, I, I have to say I, I I had trouble following your talk. Let me explain to you where I'm confused, and maybe you can help me out. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, as I see it. It was an old definition of gender identity, which is simply the, the the scientific observation. At what age does a child come to be aware that they they are they have a sex, and that uh, presumably that's ra- that is very influenced on how you raised. So if you raise a boy as a girl, then as a child, you know they're a girl, and they come to be aware that girls are treated differently in society than boys, and they come to be aware that they're a girl. Then there's the separate, the new definition where you are, this is not a question of when you become aware of your sex, you are born through some DNA where you have an identity, and this is innate. And that there's no reason why that identity is related to your uh, uh, body's uh, expression of that identity. And that some people there's a difference, and that leads to gender dysphoria. Now, when you went to this situation of a boy being raised as a girl, it seemed to me in that case we have a boy, they're mutilated, their penis is cut off, they're raised as a girl. So then, from the original version of gender identity, there comes a time in life where they realize they're a girl. But obviously, if you have your penis cut off, that's going to call, that is going to select for you being unhappy. You know, there's just something bad has happened to you, and so then we would have, so then we would expect to observe that these people are unhappy, and it seems likely that the they'll we, you know people sometimes don't know why they're unhappy. But if I was one of these people, and I came to find out they they cut my penis off and raised me as a girl. I would attribute that to uh, the fact that I'm actually a boy. So it does seem to me to be the case that you expect those children not only to be unhappy, but to want to go back to their original sex. And I thought you were saying the opposite. So if you could clarify that. would be Oh, clear. yes, yes, yes. No, the, the, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. That I mean, what you basically pointed out is, um, is some, some confound in the, the typical experimental setup, uh, namely that... 
um, at some point, the child or perhaps adult is going to discover that this is what happened, that he was uh, born uh, born a boy, his, he lost his penis in an accident, um, and he was raised as a girl. And the, the pure test of um, whether you can raise uh, boys as girls or the pure test of the new theory of gender identity uh, would be if you could just keep everything secret. So if you kept everything secret, um, would the child suffer from, from gender dysphoria? And the prediction of the new theory is that, yes, even if you kept everything secret, uh, the child would, uh, would suffer gender dysphoria. But as it happens, um, even when you don't keep everything secret, um, many, well, many, I mean, there, there's, the, the sample size is very small, as I said. Um, a number of these people are, are just quite pragmatic about the whole thing. Think, yeah, well, whatever, you know, stuff happens. I mean, maybe it wasn't ideal, but uh, I'm perfectly happy living as a woman. And um, obviously there's no prospect of uh, of going back and living as an anatomically normal man. I'll just stick with the, stick with the female role. But I mean, let's go to the thought experiment where they never find out. Yeah. It's inconceivable to me to believe that they won't have some, what you can call it dysphoria, whatever the fucking name is. But the point is, they are going to, since they have all the genes for a male and they've been raised as a female, they're going to see, it seems to me, they're going to feel as if, my God, I'm, I'm very masculine. And if that's how you define gender but... dysphoria, then of course <laughs> it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. But. Well, when you say genes for a male, you mean, I mean, they have a Y chromosome, but yeah. I mean, genetically, they're otherwise exactly the same. But um, but as I uh, pointed out in, in the case of in the case of tomboys, it's like perfectly possible to be a very well adjusted girl and yet be behaviorally very oh, masculine. Yeah. As yeah, well as me. as yes, well as probably. being say as well as being same sex attracted. I mean, normally that doesn't make you think, "Oh my God, perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm a boy after all," or something is terribly wrong. Yeah, I agree, but it would seem like, yeah, in the population there's a lot of variation, and obviously there's some girls that are more masculine, there's some men that are more yeah. feminine. But right, if you take right. the, the 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 typical male who is very masculine. That's what I would call a typical male. So if you think that these people are randomly assigned, it's most likely to be a typical male. That person is going to feel, my God, I don't feel like a woman. Well, um, I uh, yeah, well that 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 really doesn't seem to be the case, as I as I understand it empirically. I mean, I can give you some other examples if you like, but maybe we go, maybe this would maybe this would take too long. But yeah, no, I mean that's. You might well think that, but uh, but I think uh, as it happens, uh, you can live your life very comfortably as a woman, even though in many respects you're very masculine. Yeah. And um, so I also had some issues, like you know, just following your arguments, and in particular, like there was one that I just wanted to ask you about. Sure. Um, this uh, parsimony suggests that dysphoria in the persisters sort of had the same cause or uh, causes, I guess, uh, as those in the desisters. Um, yeah. And so I think my first question is simply like, if that weren't true, so if you if you can't make that statement, can you still conclude that it's a myth? And if that is not the case, then you know, what's the evidence for that? Because that seems to me like a really, really strong assumption. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. So so let me just try and re recap the argument briefly. So if you take um, some boy who has gender dysphoria and who desists, then on the orthodox conception, this shows that the, the boy was... Maybe he was originally identified as as transgender, but this shows that if so, this shows that the original 
identification was wrong. He was cisgender all along. His gender identity matched his, his sexed body. So his gender dysphoria must have some other cause. And so if the explanation of his, of, of his gender dysphoria is basically the same kind as the explanation of the gender dysphoria in the persisters, uh, then the orthodox mismatch explanation of gender dysphoria is just completely, completely redundant. Okay, so no one has ever, to my knowledge, um, found some um, significant difference between the between the persisters and the desisters, which might sort of suggest that the cause of the dysphoria in the persisters is fundamentally different from the cause in the in the desisters. I mean, as children, they're all very similar. They're very feminine boys who are uh, likely to grow up to be, if they don't uh, if they don't transition, they're very likely to grow up to be gay adults. Um, and it's not surprising, that I mean, actually, this goes back to the to the previous question. It's, I mean, this this I think is the the truth in the previous question. So if if you are an extremely feminine boy, that is behaviorally and to some extent psychologically, you're much more like typical girls than you are like like typical boys, then. It, it it shouldn't come as a shock to discover that for at least some of these boys, that that situation produces um, a feeling of discomfort and distress at their sex bodies. I mean, it's just being a girl is, seems to be a much more natural fit for them than than being a boy. Girls are the playmates they they gravitate to. Uh, not to boys. So it's not really surprising that extreme gender nonconformity can lead in children to, to gender dysphoria. Um, and it's, just to go back to the example of, of, of depression, it's like perfectly familiar that, um, sorry, this kind of case is perfectly familiar. Two people get depressed for exactly the same reason, and in one person the depression persists, and the other it doesn't persist. That doesn't mean that the initial causes were 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 different. So, I don't think it's a very strong assumption at all to think that what explains the gender dysphoria in both the persisters and the, and, and the desisters is 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 basically the same, and for various reasons, personality, uh, upbringing social circumstances, cultural milieu, whatever, uh, noise in the system, in some of these people, the gender dysphoria persists, and in others, it, it doesn't. I, I should sort of like em emphasize, I mean, just to go back to the initial worry that um, Ivan was uh, raised at the very beginning of the, uh, of the talk, that none of this, none of what I'm saying is supposed to be some argument for not... Um, um transitioning some people even even children maybe that's for all i've said maybe that's the best um the best medical solution to their uh to their discomfort and uh and distress but yeah, as far as i can see you're just totally sticking your neck out if you think that uh yeah the persisters and the and the and the desisters are just fundamentally different kinds of, of people that's that's the orthodox explanation. The persisters are the ones with the innate, immutable, misaligned gender identities, and the desisters just have regular gender identities, regular aligned gender identities, and somehow their very, very similar kinds of gender dysphoria have another cause. That seems to be very implausible to me. John? John Stadham, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Sure, I got the uh, got the mic on. Yeah, um, thanks for the talk. It's a uh, hot topic, I gather. Um, my uh, question 
started from a delightful French TV series I saw called Cardis Renoir. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Rather imaginative. In two of the episodes, uh, a hypnotist convinced the, the, the two principal characters, a, a male and female uh, uh, police inspectors, that they are the opposite sex because they bicker, you know, in, yes. in the drama, they bicker. And so maybe this way they can get to be, you know, uh, uh, more in harmony. Well, it's brilliantly done, you know, and so on. Uh, the man particularly he does a very good job of behaving like a woman and so on and so on. Okay, so this raised the question. What I wonder, Dr. Byrne, if you have had any thoughts about the relationship of these pheno this phenomenon to, first of all, acting skills. I mean, people are incredibly good actors or actors are incredibly good at doing these sorts of things. So on the one hand, acting, and on the other, multiple personality disorder, which has been around quite a long time. And in a way, um, these transgender folk are sort of extreme examples of multiple personalities. Do you have any thoughts about this? I've not read recently into the literature or anything, but maybe, maybe you, you, you have had a go at it. Um, right. Well, I... Um... Uh, yeah, I don't, I haven't looked at the, the multiple, the multiple personality disorder literature for a while. I mean, there was a, um, a big surge in diagnoses of multiple personality uh, disorder a while back, and that seems to have now faded. I think it's very unclear, um, whether multiple personality disorder is actually a real, a real condition. Um, in any event, I don't think it has anything to do with with gender dysphoria or being or being tra transgender. I mean, transgender people do not have multiple personalities in the in the in, in the MPD in the MPD sense. Well, one is very dominant. At least. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I would, I, I would, I would like to see some reason, some, some, some evidence that the two are connected. I, as far as I know, there is no evidence. Justin. Hey, Alex, uh, thank you for the talk. I guess my question is less about the substance of your talk and more about, uh, why you had to give the talk in the first place. So like, I have this idealistic notion that professional philosophers are among academics, those who are most inclined to engage in rational reasoned discourse on controversial issues. Um, so I'm just wondering why you think this particular topic raised such vitriol among professional philosophers and whether or not that is a more recent phenomenon or something that you think has been going on for a long time. Yeah, that that's... Uh... That's a good question. I mean, it certainly shows that uh, philosophers are no more immune than than other academics or the 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 public at large to these um, social social currents. Um, so that 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 discovery um, was. Uh, was a was a great disappointment to me because I think for many years I had been l laboring under the misconception that there was something special about philosophy and we were somehow uniquely tolerant of uh, dissent on all sorts of issues. Um, I mean, it's it, it has I think a lot to do with the complicated dynamics in philosophy and in particular in feminist philosophy which is the sub branch of philosophy that deals with these that deals with these issues um it really started in 2017 when rebecca tuvel published that paper in defense of transracialism in the hypatia the, which was the leading which is the leading journal of, of feminist philosophy and this caused a huge firestorm and many philosophers signed an open letter demanding that the 
the Tugel's paper be retracted. Uh, two members of her own PhD dissertation committee uh, turned on her. So that really was the 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 beginning of um, this period of intolerance for um, for people not hewing precisely to mainstream orthodox views on sex and gender. Of course, the funny thing is that in the in in Rebecca Tuval's case, um, her she was extremely, extremely progressive. She was not saying that um, uh, that transgender people uh, should be denied any rights or prevented from transitioning or treated in any way uh, other than just normal, dignified members of of society. All she was saying was that that same courtesy should be extended to people like Rachel Dolezal, um, who have a uh, transracial identity. So her progressive credentials were all for nothing, it it, uh, it turned out. But then I haven't, re I haven't really answered your question. I've just kind of reinforced the, uh, the, the observation that philosophy has become very, uh, very intolerant. Um, I mean, I hope that things are going to change, but sorry, let me just end with one with one other thing. I mean, this is really very very important. I mean, the the damage that is done by all these cancellation campaigns and the the ostracizing and shaming of people with vaguely heterodox views it, it isn't like isn't primarily. Um, uh, directed against the um, the people who suffer this ostracism and shaming, although it, it, it can indeed be very damaging to them personally. But the main damage is to the the discipline itself, because of course all this acts as as a very great deterrent to younger scholars who are interested in this area and who are worried that maybe when they look into it, they're going to arrive at unapproved conclusions so uh you know jobs in academia and in, in philosophy are hard to come by at, at the best of times so it's not surprising that just for self-interested reasons um you would be very wise if you're a junior scholar not to touch this topic with a with, with a barge pole so i mean for that reason the the damage will be quite quite long lasting i think uh, I thought I have maybe a final question. So I'm interested in sort of in the implications for the, for the medical profession. You talked about, you know, in the U.S. we have the First Amendment. But on the other hand, it seems to me that, that, that some of this activism has been very successful in terms of shaping the way we address the problem when there is one. Um, for example, people are talking about you know, the medical profession in the U.S. being very aggressive with respect to treatments when it comes to kids and so on. Um, it, sometimes even disregarding the evidence from other countries, right? Uh, so, so that is right. Do, do, what explains that? What, why is it that uh, that again the medical profession seems to be sort of caving to to pressure? I mean, this uh, this is an, a, a question. So I'm probably yeah no right yeah that's an excellent question as you as you mm -hmm. pointed out um, the enthusiasm for so called gender affirming care is is much higher in the u s than it is in europe and and the u k um many countries in europe have um uh, pulled back from that that gender affirming model which really actually began in in the netherlands in the in the 1990s, I guess, when dysphoric, a very carefully selected group of dysphoric children were treated with, with puberty blockers. So let me just make two, two points. So the the first point is that the the orthodox conception of gender identity makes it very hard to avoid the gender affirming model. So on the orthodox conception of, of gender identity, gender dysphoria is caused by this mismatch between an innate immutable gender identity 
and one sexed body. And this is the thing that I mentioned in passing, but didn't make much of during the talk. Each person is an authority on their own gender identity. So what that basically means is that the patient is automatically in the driving seat. So in order to know what, I mean, some clinicians literally just do talk this way, that in order to know what a child's gender identity is, you only have to ask. That's the the the, the almost infallible way of finding out someone's, someone's gender identity. Um, Okay, so now we found out that this child has gender uh, has a certain gender identity. Let's say a female gender identity, but uh, but the child is male. The child has gender dysphoria. Uh, what do we do? Well, the gender identity is the uh, is the immutable thing, and the body is the is the mutable thing. So we have to we have to change the body maybe by administering puberty blockers and later cross sex hormones. Um, so that makes like medicalization, like almost inevitable. You don't really need any empirical evidence. Um, it, it's like the only thing that could that could conceivably uh, work. Okay, so that was the first point. And then the, the the second point is, and this is really your your question: What explains the difference between the U.S. and uh, and, and other countries like, say, the U.K., which is now um, I, I believe restricted the use of puberty blockers to uh, to clinical settings, and the the main uh, gender clinic uh, GIDS, the Gender Identity Development Service, which is I believe the, the largest in Europe, is slated for closure. Um, I think the the reason or one main reason is that in the UK and other uh, European uh, countries, there's uh, there's uh, there's nationalised uh, healthcare. So we have a national healthcare service in in the UK, funded by the taxpayers, and this means that um, there's not really as much money going around as there is in uh, the US. And there's much more concern paid to costs and uh, efficacy. Um, treatments have to be proven. You have to have um, evidence for some treatment, especially if it's going to be a, a pretty expensive one. Uh, so that kind of automatic uh, scrutiny of whether um, treatments pass a cost-benefit analysis is um much more likely to occur in the uk and other european countries than it is it is in the us with a very different healthcare system so i i think that's at least part of the explanation okay thank you very much alex a great talk hopefully next time you'll join us in person thank you everybody for joining us today and uh...